Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I'm Jakob Weinstein, as Dan mentioned, and I'm going to talk about a universal operator theoretic framework for um, quantum fault tolerance. And uh, this is work that's being done in the MITRE Quantum Information Science Group, which, of which I'm a part of, and uh, um, in joint with Robert Calderbank and his group at Princeton University. So uh, our framework, um, which makes use of super operators, we call operator quantum fault tolerance. And uh, the question is, why, why would we want to formulate fault tolerance in such a way? And so there are a number of answers. Uh, first of all, um, from a very, from just a perspective of, of representation, an operator formalism of fault tolerance would um, act to fault, quantum fault tolerance just as operator quantum error correction acts towards a quantum error correction. So it's an extension into operator space representation um, of quantum fault tolerance. It, it would provide a top-down approach to fault tolerance, starting with the system dynamics as the first, uh, as the first thing to take into account. Um, it then also would establish an operator theoretic foundation which will connect error correction to fault tolerance. And finally, we hope that it will actually give us improved accuracy of, the er of error thresholds. So um, let's start with quantum error correction. And th there's a hierarchy of quantum error correction, and maybe I'll get to the question that was, the last question that was asked in the previous talk. Um, let's start off with our initial state. So we have some um, quantum information that we'd like to protect, and we have a bunch of ancilla that we'll stick on. And from now on, at least for this slide, I'm going to be in Liouvillean space. So I'm going to be in a space where density matrices are, are vectors and super operators are our matrices. Okay, so this saves me from writing things on both sides. I'm just going to write things on one side. So standard quantum error correction, um, the error recovery condition states that you have some um, you have some information that you'd like to protect. You encode it um, using some super, oper super operator V encode. There's some error that occurs, um, epsilon, and then there's a recovery operation, which um, hopefully will fix the error that occurred, um, and then there's some decoding. That's standard error correction. In the operator formalism of quantum error correction, there's additional gauge qubits, so which subsume into standard quantum error correction, decoherence-free subspaces and noise noiseless subsystems. So this this is represented by the addition of this W um, uh, operator, which is going to tack on the gauge qubits and then also um, encode whatever information is necessary into the noiseless sub generalized noiseless subsystems. And there's going to be a projection operator and a trace, as we've seen in, uh, in, in, previous, in previous talks, which have mentioned operator quantum error correction. Um, Todd Brun was kind enough to explain um, an operator formulation of entanglement-assisted quantum error correction. And um, Todd didn't show this, um, this equation explicitly, but, um, but it's implicit in what he, in what he said. Um, now, we, again, we still have an encoding and a decoding and gauge qubits and so on and so forth, but now they all have a bunch of e-bits. Um, uh, that, are, that are around, half of them belong to Alice, half of them belong to Bob, and so the encoding and the additional of the gauge qubits, the error and the recovery will all act on those qubits um, as well. And finally, Ali Reza spoke in the, in the last talk about linear quantum error correction, and I, 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 I think, um, uh, though maybe Ali Reza doesn't, didn't say this explicitly, that it is somehow, it is, uh, it does encompass within it um, entanglement-assisted quantum, um, operator quantum error correction, and that is, there's, again, there's an encoding, um, we have to, you would add on some qubits necessary for gauge qubits and the like, um, except this time, the error that occurs and the recovery operation are, um, are not completely positive um, that the the additional qubits the uh, the entanglement the correlation that's necessary between the qubits that you're trying to protect and the ancilla qubits can take place here in the in, in the encoding but in general linear quantum error correction should encompass all other all other forms of quantum error correction that we've seen okay so that's just a quick overview of quantum error correction and I'd like to now forget about all of that and just call this complete dynamics p Okay, so everything that you're going to do to your system, which um, is going to end up protecting you from the errors that occur, all the encoding, all the decoding, all your noise of subsystems, all your recoveries, everything that you're going to do, let's just call it P. And P is some map. It's a linear map in general. It doesn't have to be completely positive. Um, and so the error recovery condition becomes this very simple, um, uh, simple formula, P times rho minus rho equals zero. Okay, so that's quantum error correction. There it is up there. Now, I'm going to extend this 
formalism to um, quantum fault tolerance. So before I do that, though, I'm going to switch from Liouville space back to uh, a Krauss-like operator, an operator sum space. Um, and again, these are not Krauss operators because they are not they are not necessarily completely positive. So here here it is. And now again, I'm I'm back in Hilbert space. So my density matrices are now actually matrices, and I'm operating with these Krauss-like operators on uh, on a Hilbert space. Okay, so this is linear quantum error correction, but now I've gone from Leo Williams space back to uh, back to operator sum space. Okay, so quantum error correction involves, as we've seen in, um, in many previous talks, the protection of information as it traverses a channel. And this is distinct from fault tolerance in that fault tolerance has some sort of dynamics that goes on. So let's assume that we have some dynamics that we'd like to implement, and we'll just call it, we'll call it U. Um, and let's see what happens when we you know, try to make a formulation similar to the error recovery formulation, but this time including some dynamics in it. Okay, so my row now has this ideal, the, the ideal unitary acting on it. And now my operator sum is no longer these EK and EK primes, but some AK and AK prime. Now, AK and AK prime are not necessarily um, uh, U times, oh, that should be EK, I apologize. It's not necessarily U times EK, it's some other operator sum, which encompasses within it not only all my error correction and so on and so forth, recovery and, and uh, gauge qubits and so on, but it also includes the actual implementation of, of, the, of the dynamics U, or as well as, as, well as I can perform it. Um, and what I mean by as well as I can perform it is that obviously when we are doing things experimentally or in the future when we may have a quantum computer or not, things are not going to work perfectly. They may work fault tolerantly, but there's, they're not going to work perfectly. And and so this zero over here is really uh, is really not correct. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to quantify this difference by putting a norm around it, and then I'm going to say, well, in order for my computation to work, I want my norm, the difference in this this norm over here, which is the difference between my actual implementation and what I'd like, to be less. I'm going to prescribe that it be less than some um, uh, than some than some parameter alpha. Okay, so this equation, um, which, I, which now encompasses within it um, quantum fault tolerance, we call the quantum computer condition. And again, it encompasses the following. There's some ideal unitary with which, which I'd like to implement on some initial state. Um, obviously, I can't actually implement it as well as I'd like, but this is the actual implementation of my quantum computer. Um, again, it describes the full dynamics, including everything that we've talked about with respect to quantum error correction and the like. Um, I'm going to quantify this by the Schatten, this difference by the Schatten 1 norm, and then I'm going to bound it by some prescribed accuracy, which is alpha. So this, uh, this thing on the left over here, I'm going to, going to call the implementation inaccuracy. That's how much off I am in my implementation of the dynamics U, and then this is a bound on the implementation inaccuracy. Okay, so this is a quantum computer condition. So just let's take a moment to talk about this equation. First of all, um, the implementation inaccuracy is may, may be a useful metric for quantifying um, how well we've done some sort of implementation. Again, as, as, as I showed, this is simply a, um, a, der a derivation of the error recovery condition. That's all, that's, that's all I've done. Um, the QCC, as, again, as we saw, includes within it all types of error, of, of error correction. Um, again, to get back to standard formulations of error correction, what I do is I would set u equal to the identity, because quantum error correction is just traversal of a channel, and then I said alpha equal to zero, um, and then these AKs would just involve the various error encoding, decoding, recovery, and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, the QCC is going to be the basis of our top-down approach to operator um, uh, quantum fault tolerance, which is based on the actual dynamics of, of my system. So let's talk about that for a minute. All right, so here's my, here, here's my QCC um, with the full prescription of the dynamics of the system compared to what I actually want to want to do. And now, as, as I try to protect, as I try to implement my, um, uh, my, 
my problem, my, uh, my algorithm better and better, I'm going to concatenate more and more so I can solve for more and more errors. So I'm going to just show this by this, by this I. So I stands for the, concatena the concatenation level. Um, and it's not necessary that the, that the uh, map be the same or at all related when you go from one concatenation level to another. So how can I tell whether my concatenation works or not? Well, in order to see that, I need that as I concatenate one level further, my implementation inaccuracy, which is this value over here, goes down. Okay, so in order to look at that, I'm going to take a supremum over all initial states so that I cover any possible initial state. And I'm going to say, if my implementation inaccuracy at level um, uh, i plus one over my implementation inaccuracy over level i is less than one, that shows that my implementation, my inaccuracy, the inaccuracy in, in, in what I was doing went down, and therefore it was a good idea to concatenate. Obviously, if this value is greater than one, that shows that my errors have gotten worse, and therefore the concatenation that I did was a mistake, and I shouldn't have done it, um, and therefore I see that it fails. This is the, uh, this is operator quantum fault tolerance. Okay, let's look at an example. So an example is uh, local stochastic noise. So my system dynamics, I'm going to describe it this map over here. Now I'm back in completely positive, um, uh, back to completely positive map, and uh, I'm back to Krauss operators. So my first Krauss operator is going to be just the unitary dynamics, but it's modified by some one minus epsilon. So epsilon then, well, let me, let, me, let me be careful about this. One minus epsilon is the probability that I actually implemented you exactly. Okay, and then there's an epsilon times everything else where everything else is all the errors that, all, all the errors that may have occurred. Okay, um, again, I'm going, to, I, I'm going to stick this model um, as my AKs in the previous, in the, over, over here, I'll stick that model into there. And what I end up with is the following. I have an epsilon that comes out on the outside, and then I have this difference, again, between the, what's the error operators over here, that's this part, minus the actual um, dynamics that I was trying to implement. If, um, uh, if, if this is less than one, then I've, I've succeeded, and if it's greater than one, then I, then I have succeeded in my concatenation. But now I can compare this formulation to what's generally regarded as the, as the success criterion for fault tolerance, and I see that there's a modification on, uh, on, on what you might think is the, is the success criterion. And this modification accounts um, for strengths of error. So this difference over here, what it's doing is it's giving me some numerical value of how strong my error is independent of just epsilon, which is the probability of an error occurring. Okay, so let's look at, um, uh, let's look a, a little more carefully since, the, uh, since it's, not, it's not quite so simple. Um, and at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume perfect, perfect, syndrome, perfect syndrome measurements. I don't need to assume that in the general formulation, but for the moment, that's what I'll assume. And this is what my error model is going to be. My error model is, it's, it's not a, it's, it's a, I'll have a sigma x error on each qubit with probability px. So for every qubit, there's a probability px that there will be a sigma x rotation. Um, similarly with sigma y and sigma z on each, on each qubit. Now, what is my final logical qubit going, going to look like? Okay, so this is in general. I haven't done any, I, I haven't specified any specific codes or not, but when I, when I look at the final logical qubit, there's going to be some probability that, that, nothing, that nothing happened to it, that or oh, whatever error correction I did and recovery and so on, syndrome measurements and so on and so forth, that was, that was all successful. And the probability of that happening is one minus epsilon x minus epsilon y minus epsilon z, where the epsilons now are dependent on the, on the P's and on the choice of code and on the recovery and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's, that's the probability that I'll, I'll get back the correct, um, uh, the correct density matrix, the one that I wanted. But then there's going to be some, you know, some, uh, these, I shouldn't call these probabilities, what we actually have is a mixed, a mixed state. Um, so the mixed state accounts for, you know, the perfect, um, the perfect density matrix, plus some, um, some amplitude of a um, density matrix that's been rotated by sigma x, some amplitude by sigma y, and some amplitude by, by sigma z. Okay, so now let's look at a specific, oh, well, let's, okay, let's take the implementation and accuracy of, of, of that. And, uh, 
if I just substitute this final density matrix into the equations that, we've, that, that I showed on the last slide, then this is what I get. And what you see is that there are these epsilons they, I can I could bring them out of the I could bring them out of the norm, but they still I can't I can't get rid of them totally. They still s survive within the norm, showing that a simple um, uh, a simple a simple separation between epsilon and the and the um, uh, and just the problem uh, between epsilon and the error strength is not is not warranted. I see in here that my error strength comes into account, um, and this is very simple a very simple example that I've chosen. And what I've shown here is actually a a plot of the OQFT condition, the ratio between. Let me let me go back since I put it on this page. Oh. So I'm showing uh, this this um, uh, this ratio over here. And I'm in a space that has px, py, and pz as I defined it up as, as I defined them up here. This is for a 513 code, and this contour over here is when that ratio equals one. So in other words, if my p is less than, is it, if my px, py, and pz live in, in this region over here, then my concatenation from the first level to the second level was successful, and my errors have gone down, and then I may decide to keep concatenating if I need even, even greater accuracy, or I can leave it here if, I have, if I've determined that my accuracy is good enough. However, if my px, py, and pz live out here somewhere, and just to give you numbers, each one of these corners is, is 0.15. This is the origin. Each one of these corners is 0.15 in px, py, and pz. If I live out here, then my second concatenation is, has not been successful. In fact, I've made my errors, I've made my errors worse. Um, and therefore, I better think of some other way to, uh, to, to, impro to improve my implementation. So um, just to conclude, um, I've introduced the QCC, which provides a unifying picture for all forms of quantum error correction and avoidance. Um, the approach that I've presented also introduces the implementation accuracy, which may be a useful metric for quantifying how well any implementation, any implementation of a quantum computer has been done. Um, the QCC provides a universal operator theoretic framework for operator quantum fault tolerance, as, as we've talked about. Um, but there's much work still to do. Um, we've explored only a number of different error models and error codes. And of course, we haven't actually calculated any error threshold values. That's all, that's all still to come in future work. Um, um, the related papers are here, and thank you very much. Questions? So why, uh, you didn't motivate it very well, why are you using a one? Oh, so, okay, so the, I, I didn't motivate it because I skipped it entirely, to be honest.